Democracy, How to Turn Back the Authoritarian Tide. My name is Liana Fix, I'm Program Director at Kerber Foundation. I will moderate this discussion today on perhaps one of the greatest challenges, one of the greatest challenge of our times. The Washington Post adopted in February um, 2017, shortly after the election of Donald Trump, for the first time in its 140 year history, a slogan for the newspaper, which was democracy dies in darkness. Four years later, the US seems at least to have risen like a phoenix from the ashes, but politics based on fear continue to resonate with large voting blocs. And at the same time, Europe still faces its own and ever growing illiberal challenge. The pandemic has obviously further increased economic and racial inequalities, and also the next challenges are just around the corner. The climate crisis, trade, finance, labor markets, unbound from the nation state, highlight to some extent how inadequate our existing forms of governance are. So as the end of the 2020s, the question is, and the question for our discussion today also is, how can democracies renew their core institution and turn back the authoritarian tide? Let me introduce our great speakers for this session today. We have with us Ivan Krustev, who is the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences. He's also the founding board member of the ECFR and a member of the board of trustees of the International Crisis Group. He's a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and author of several acclaimed books, among others, The Light That Failed. Agnieszka Dziemanowicz Bong is a Polish left wing social activist and politician, a member of the same since 2019. And in 2016, she was voted by foreign policy into its annual list of 100 most influential global thinkers for her role in organizing the black protests against a total ban on abortion in Poland. She's also actively involved in the fight for LGBT equality and workers' rights and has organized a center for legal help. Then we also have with us Michael Bertz. He's a senior fellow at the Center for American, American Progress in DC. He taught as adjunct professor at the Center for German and European Studies in the School of Foreign Service at the Georgetown University. He was a senior transatlantic fellow with the GMF, and he's an expert on US and European foreign policy, migration policy, and climate migration. Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you here with us. And we will start our discussion today with the first scene setter by Ivan Krustev, who will give us his five to seven minute take, followed by a moderated discussion and a Q&A. So you can already start thinking about what questions you have to our speakers, and you will then later have the chance to contribute your questions via the chat function. With this, this is all from my side for the moment. Over to you, Ivan, for your first input. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of the discussion. And listen, the scene is well set and well viewed even without any introduction. Uh, so one of the first question is, can the spread of the coronavirus led to the spread of the virus of authoritarianism? And on one level, the answer looks easy. It is the case. Uh, them uh, basically declared that uh, last year, 2020, the number of people, the percent of the population of the world li living in liberal democracies is absolutely the same like it was uh, in 1990. Uh, but in a way, my argument is going to be that probably the impact of the pandemic is for the moment at least slightly more limited than we tend to, uh, 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 to argue about it for two specific reasons. The first is that pandemic was not a disruption. It was much more accelerator of trends that have been there before. And when it comes to democracy, one of the trends that I found much more dangerous basically than simply the rise of certain authoritarian powers was that we see during this long year of plague, continuing decline of the trust in public institutions in most of the countries. There were an expectations and probably there was a hope that because of this collective experience that we had, because of the fact that basically people were put in a situation very different than their normal everyday life, uh, because it was about public health and not about finance or something that is much far away from the way people can experience that, we're going to end up with a 
more trust in institutions, more trust in experts, and also kind of a much more open public debate. At least for the moment, this is not the case. Uh, data which uh, ECFR have been collecting, and I'm now talking about Europe, is that unfortunately uh, the spread of mistrust uh, uh, has not been reversed. The second thing that came as a result of the pandemic, but in my view was very much before it simply became much more visible, was uh, that uh, clash between the United States and China, particularly, more and more is perceived as a kind of a systemic rivalry between the democratic countries and authoritarian regimes, and not simply the clash of the two super powers. And this is at least how it was very much framed by the new American administration. I'm saying this because uh, when uh, the pandemic started, one of the questions that was usually asked was, who is going to perform better? Democracy, authoritarian regimes. And now, probably 18 uh, months later, the strange story is that, first, we don't know the answer because the pandemic is not over and because the winners and losers are changing places very much these days. But secondly, it turned out that the nature of the political regime is not as a strong predicator when it comes to the response for the pandemic than you can expect. There was some democracy that did very well, at least for the moment. Some of the Asian democracies like uh, Taiwan uh, uh, or South Korea, there are some European democracy that did well. China did well, but there's some other authoritarian regimes that didn't overperform, let's put it like this. So saying all this, uh, and when we basically are trying to imagine what kind of a change we can expect as a result of the pandemic, uh, in the next three or four minutes, basically I want to make just two arguments. One is we risk not to see how much has changed for these 18 months because staying home and in a certain way living in frozen, uh, there was a major change on the policy level that has happened. But secondly, we probably can be unaware of some of the obstacles for the further change when we try to imagine what can happen. On what has changed? I'm going to argue that in the last 18 months, Europe revisited all the major policy conclusions it has reached about the three previous crises that shattered the Union in the last 10 years. I mean the terror crisis, uh, I mean the refugee crisis, and I mean the financial crisis. If you go back to the anti-terror legislation that have been discussed in Europe basically since 9-11, but most probably, uh, most uh, eager kind of actively after the terrorist attacks in Spain and France, you're going to see that contrary to the Americans after 9-11, Europeans were much more reluctant to basically allow the government to constrain their individual rights because of uh, the threat of terrorism. And it was very strongly to the extent that somebody like uh, the radical Italian philosopher Gamben in 2004, he said, I'm not going to fly to the United States because of kind of a rejections of the type of uh, restrictions that have been put there. But when Agamben tried to use the same argument when it comes to restrictions coming out of the pandemic, the majority of the people didn't buy it. They said, listen, there is a major difference between certain type of a policies and even kind of a surveillance techniques that have been used in order to reduce and contain the pandemic and what was happening during the anti-terror legislation. And I'm saying this because as a result of these changes, one of the strange kind of reversal that we start to see in Europe, very much in European politics, is that some of the populist parties, both on the far left and far right, until recently, have been accused of speaking the language of a strong leader and asking for much more authoritarian power, suddenly got a libertarian conversion and positions themselves as a defenders of liberty. Uh, you can see this during the Spanish debate, you can see in Germany, you can see in other places. Uh, when it comes uh, uh, to the migration and uh, the refugee crisis, COVID-19 managed to close more borders than the refugee crisis ever did. And the truth is that basically all countries, liberal and illiberal, close almost at the same hour. Uh, but at the same time, we see a much more inclusive treatment of non-citizens in most of your member states because you realize that you cannot treat differently people who want to contain the, uh, the pandemic. So what we basically end out of the pandemic is, is a situation in which the external borders of the European Union are closed. And I do believe it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of debate to try basically to argue for opening them.
And at the same time, nobody is really ready to support much the closing of the borders within the European Union. Even nationalists realize that probably staying at home is good, but you cannot do it for the whole of your life. And particularly on the financial uh, uh, front, the change was incredible. In a certain way, as a result of the pandemic, European Union did everything that it refused to do as the result of uh, the financial crisis of 2010, 2012. I'm saying this because this change has happened. And this change has happened on the policy level. This change has happened uh, on the level of the public consensuses. But strangely enough, they happened in a very non controversial way, as if this kind of a revision was very much natural. Nobody was outraged, uh, nobody was unhappy. The three previous consensus is much more died out of the natural deaths. Uh, and now there is an expectation that because of all this, because of the pandemics, uh, societies are ready for much more radical changes. And you can hear these people when they talk about how pandemic is going to change our view on climate, uh, how it's going to change our view on economic policies. I'm going to end up with two arguments why we should be very careful to believe that people are very much in a natural kind of a radical breakthrough mode. One is nostalgia. Paradoxically, I don't know that uh, the COVID-19 infected people with authoritarianism, but now when we see, at least we hope that we're seeing uh, the recess of the pandemic, uh, you can see that uh, nostalgia for change is very much nostalgia for going back where we have been before. It is kind of demand for normality. And as a result of it, in a certain way, people believe that they got enough change, particularly on their daily day life, and certain things that just two or three years ago they're going to see as undesirable now is something that we are wishing for. So psychologically, from this point of view, strangely enough, the COVID-19 can have a very strong conservative message. Nostalgia is becoming the change we're looking for. And secondly, uh, what was, and in my view, is something to be discussed in the future, but uh, the pandemic experience was like an open lessons in demography. Suddenly, every society learns what is the demographic structure of it. How many people over 85? How many people at 40? Because of uh, the risk of dying, because of the vaccinations, suddenly we realized, not just theoretically, but in our day experience, how much we're aging and how much the young generation basically is the new minority. So strangely enough, the young generation, which is also going to end up with the biggest loser uh, uh, of the post-pandemic world, do not have the numbers to produce the change that we're talking about. And I'm going to end up with the question, in my view, how to empower in a democratic set, a generation that does not have the numbers is going to be one of the major issues that we're facing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ivan. That really was a thought provoking input statement. I have a lot of issues to follow up with the question on the US and China. Liana, I think you're muted, Liana. Yeah. So thank you so much. I think now everyone should hear me. 15 months into the pandemic and these things still happen. So let me thank you once again, even for the thought provoking input statement. I think there was a lot to chew on and a lot of thoughts. Um, I think we will come back to the question of the US and China as a competition of governance system. We will definitely also come back to what extent um, the pandemic has made us more conservative and what this means for the young generation, especially when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, but first, let me turn it over to our panelists, further panelists here. Um, we had some internet connection problems. Um, Agnieszka, are you here with us right now? Can you hear us? Agnieszka Jemanowicz Bonk. Okay, I can't hear you at the moment. So perhaps we first turn it over to you, Michael. Um, ah. and now this might look better. Okay, we'll give it a second. We'll turn it over to you, Michael, first. Um, 
the United States, I just alluded to it at the beginning. It seems now with Biden, so much has been going on in terms of, in terms of reforms. We've seen massive rescue package, infrastructure packages. And I think to some extent, this was not expected because he was considered to be a moderate president. And now suddenly he seems to become a transformational president to some extent for the United States. Is the United States back? And if yes, for how long? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Diana, for this question. And it's great to be uh, uh, on this uh, panel with uh, Agnesha and, uh, and Ivan. The, the short answer to your question is no, the United States is not back, at least not yet. Um, although uh, President Biden might think differently, and if you read his inauguration speech, you will see that he not only said America's back, but that he also said things like uh, America secured liberty at home and stood once again as a beacon to the world. And that he said, we are a great nation, we are a good people, we can do great things, important things, uh, we can right wrongs. So his speech was very optimistic. Um, it was deeply situated uh, in the tradition of American ex exceptionalism that is paradigmatic for his generation, not only for conservatives, but also for Democrats. And at the same time, his speech often sounded as a morning of loss of unity, uh, given the massive confrontation in American society and the fact that a bunch of uh, fascists tried to storm the uh, Capitol only two weeks before, two and a half weeks before the president gave this speech. Um, he tried to provide something like meaning and inspiration to the American people in his uh, speech, uh, sometimes difficult to uh, digest for European ears with religious over and undertones. Um, but all in all, I read and heard this speech as something like a fading echo from a past era. Um, and um, I think what you say with regard to the domestic policy in the United States is actually true. Um, this is a massive investment and reinvestment in trying to establish something like a common good, a body politic and greater unity in American society. Whether that will succeed is far from clear, but it is a progressive agenda that is being set by a young generation of Democrats that has really moved the party, which for European standards was under Bill Clinton and under Barack Obama, a center-right party in terms of financial, fiscal, social, and, and military policies, has moved this party more into a social liberal or social democratic direction. Unfortunately, that has not translated in foreign affairs yet because that is a much more traditional approach. But uh, by Joe Biden is certainly, uh, I think in the best of cases, a transitional figure that will help stabilize the United States. But if he suggests that democracy is safe and secure, that is just a fallacy and a wrong assessment. Uh, we are still in the middle of a massive fight uh, for like the supremacy of democratic convictions in educated middle classes in the United States. 45% of Republican voters thought that uh, storming the Capitol was okay, or at least uh, not a bad idea. Um, you have 40% uh, of Republican men uh, are refusing to get vaccinated. There is still massive friction within American society. So the midterm elections in 2022 in November of next year, and even more so the uh, presidential election 2024, at earliest will indicate whether you can really count on that great project that started in 7076 to continue. If I can follow up with a concrete question. You also argued in an article, Michael, that America must relearn democracy also because there are over 70 million voters. How can these voters um, be brought back to a more democratic consensus? If you had one concrete proposal for Biden, how he can do this, um, with a look to the midterm elections and then the next presidential elections, what would be your suggestion? Look, uh, what Joe Biden has done is addressing the corona crisis. And as Ivan has said, it, obviously COVID has been a learning lesson in dem demography for many of us. It has also been a learning lesson in democracy. Because the fact that West prosperous, wealthy Western societies, after a year of COVID, which was kind of a medium-sized challenge in crisis, have been starting to fall apart at the fringes, where institutions have been weakened, where we realize that the democratic um, depth of convictions is much shallower than we anticipated. 
Um, but Joe Biden has tried to address that crisis, that health crisis, very, very aggressively. And as you mentioned, he has passed massive investment packages to uh, signal to people in the United States that this country actually uh, can modernize itself in renewing a social contract. I think he is implicitly addressing the successful fear campaign that Donald Trump and the Republicans ran that got Donald Trump the presidency. And that is much more difficult to express explicitly because Donald Trump was successful in creating a Bermuda Triangle of fear where the uh, pivotal points were um, terrorism in the face of Islam, immigration symbolized by Mexico, and globalization symbolized by trade and the United States getting shortchanged by China and the Western partners. And that in that Bermuda Triangle of fear, a lot of middle class Americans lost themselves. As you mentioned, the president, former President Trump had over 70 million voters. We have discussed the fact of what we euphemistically call non-college whites, which is like Midwestern hillbillies, uh, rural proletarians that massive transfer from Obama voters to Trump voters. We have discussed this to death and analyzed it in and out. But this is, even if you're generous, 12 to 15 million voters. So there are 48 to 50 million middle-class voters in the United States that are prosperous, that are safe, that send their kids to good schools, that live in a society where more people die on treadmills and gymnasiums that are being killed by terrorists internationally. And they still have made the decision not only to elect Donald Trump, but also to give him even more votes in the last election last November. That is really difficult to address. And I try to describe these um, prosperous conservative middle classes as virtual immigrants. These are people that have emigrated out of the moral context that has been established by the American engagement in two world wars in Europe, by the civil rights uh, movement, and they've also emigrated from our constitutional and democratic traditions. That is really difficult to address. And that's why I'm saying this is a lengthy process. It is far too early to tell, and there are no easy answers. Thank you so much. That's an interesting concept of the virtual immigrants. Um, Ivan, you already alluded to the struggle between the or the competition between the United States and China as a competition between governance systems. In the election campaign, Joe Biden proposed a summit of democracies. And now that he's in Europe, um, that's also a prominent topic that he featured in his Washington Post article, how can democracy deliver? So it seems he sees the domestic crisis of democracy at home as part of a larger international crisis. Do you think this framing of a struggle between systems of the competition between the United States and China is helpful to make progress to turn back the authoritarian tide? And I'm asking this especially because as you all know, um, especially Berlin is kind of skeptical of this framing of China as a systemic competitor. Uh, thank you very much. Listen, uh, most of the words that we're using uh, in this new situation, like competitive, <laughs> uh, competitor or strategic competitor, it's never very clear what exactly what we mean. Uh, but there are three things that are critical. If in 1990s, there was an idea that liberal democracy and modernization are kind of a synonymous. So you can have certain type of authoritarian regimes, but the more you're going to see the spread of capitalism, the spread of capitalism is going basically to bring the spread of democracy. And we can argue when this is going to happen. We can argue how well it is going to happen in different things. Uh, but all these kind of uh, authoritarian capitalist regimes were perceived as deviations, never as an alternative. And of course, what has changed is that China came with a model, which is obviously capitalist, uh, but at the same time, uh, China, at least for the moment, did not prove the central kind of a thesis of modernization that economic competition is going to bring demand for political competition. And there are certain developments, particularly in the area of technology, that makes us even more skeptical because in the world in which basically some of the technologies and artificial intelligence knows better than us what we're going to do, uh, there is no much need to ask the voters where to stand. So this is real. 
So from this point of view, to say that there is no alternative to the liberal democracies is not true. What is not helpful is to try to basically frame this type of a competition as a kind of the second coming of the Cold War, because this is not the second coming of the Cold War. In a certain way, it could be much more difficult. In a certain way, it could be much more risky, but this is not the Cold War for a very simple reason. Uh, Soviet Union and liberal West during the Cold War represented the two universalist kind of ideology, both of them, by the way, rooted in the European Enlightenment, that tried to transform the world as a whole. Uh, and both of them claim that future belongs to them. The interesting story about China is that China does not have this universalist aspiration of the Soviet Union. China is not interested to make Bulgaria a China type of regime. For China is enough basically Bulgarians to do what is in China interest. Uh, and from this point of view, uh, ideological transformation of the world is not as substantial for the Chinese hegemonic project as it was for the Soviet one. Secondly, what can be a problem with this frame is the following. When I, I really do believe that there are going to be a lot of competition uh, uh, and rivalry between not simply United States, but also European Union and China, uh, there is a tendency to see all the problems that our liberal democracies are facing as something that is caused by the external factors. Be it Russia, be it China, I don't believe that this is going to help us. Russians and Chinese are not particularly interested in the success of our political systems, let's put it mildly. If they have an opportunity, they're going to help us to commit a suicide. Uh, but many of the problems that we are seeing in our societies are very much the result of the economic, technological and cultural shifts in our societies. So in a certain way, the idea of resilience is not the same as the idea of defense. It's not about simply defending our democracies. We should also reinvent and innovate them. Uh, because one of the major stories is that you have different feeling of exclusions. Strangely enough, you have more and more kind of a democratic voters that do not believe uh, that they uh, uh, can decide the futures of their societies. But what is even more important, you have two processes that go together, fragmentation and polarization. And polarization basically and fragmentation of the public space is creating the idea and the nightmare of ungovernable democracies. What also Michael was talking about. Listen, if every election in the United States, we are going basically to wait for the election results as if it is going to be not just a change of government, but a regime change. This is a different world. And also Europeans, we have other problems which are ours. So from this point of view, it is absolutely fair to say, listen, we are living in a world which is much more hostile. Uh, they are now a very important superpower like China, who is trying to promote their interests, to promote basically their view of the world. Uh, and we should take it seriously and we should respond to this. But I don't believe that China is going to be enough to consolidate democratic regimes. There is much more that should come as a re from inside of what we're doing. Thank you so much, Ivan. I think that's an excellent opportunity to try again and bring in Agnieszka Germanowicz Spong. Agnieszka, can you hear us now even without video? Okay, I think not yet. If yes, please feel free to say some, something the moment you can hear us and contribute, because I would love to pose some questions to you also with regard to the situation in Poland. But if not, Hello, hello. Can ah, wonderful. You? Yes, oh, we can hi. hear you. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, thank so, you. We don't know is America back, but Poland is back. Yes, and that's the I'm... best news. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us for the discussion. I guess I might. I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no worries. I, I will try to pose a question to you. Let's see whether it, whether it comes through. Um, there's this one book, I just have it next to me because I was um, very much impressed by it, by Anne Applebaum, The Twilight of Democracy, where she describes a New Year's Eve party in 1999 in Poland, where there were a lot of liberals with a lot of hope for the future, which has changed. And Anne Applebaum also just published an article where she argues that Poland is becoming, to some extent, a 
an example of a new hybrid of democracy and autocracy, of new hybrid systems. Is that also how you would describe the state of democracy in Poland or what would be your take? Well, uh, to some extent, I would I, I, I would uh, agree with uh, an Apple uh, Applebound and the concept of this uh, this kind of uh, hybrid, and I'm sure that this is quite common knowledge by by, by now that democracy in Poland uh, in the past few years have been going through serious and deepening crisis. Uh, at the same time, sustaining the very basic uh, indexes of Okay, I think we lost you again, Agnieszka. We will try to get back to you at a later point. But since I we really was really intrigued by this concept of a hybrid between autocracy and democracy, let me for a second give this question back to you, Ivan. Um, is this one of the new models that especially to some extent also apply to Central Europe and to developments in Central Europe if we look at Hungary and Poland? Well, listen, uh, the biggest issue, uh, at least the way I see it, is not so much the rise of the classical authoritarianism or even the rise of China, but simply the border between democracy and authoritarianism is probably the, le the least protected border these days. And it goes with the fact that a lot of people are going to agree that majority have the rights to rule. The only problem is how to treat minorities. I mean, also political minorities. I'm not talking only about uh, ethnic or religious minorities. So what you see is a much more version of democratic majoritarianism, which means a democratic regime that is not interested on in being self-restrained, be it through independent media, being through independent judiciary. Uh, there is a lot of things to explain where it comes from. By the way, it is also as a different story in different countries. One of the optical illusions is that when you see a hybrid regime, you try to explain all of them with the same explanation key. And this is not the case. But obviously uh, we are seeing this type of a crossing the border between democracy and liberalism, uh, democracy and authoritarianism. Now these borders are crossed as much basically as the border between the Balkan states in the 19th century, kind of smuggling authoritarianism in democracy and probably smuggling also democracy in authoritarianism is the new trait. Thank you, Ivan. And let me take this to turn it over to you, Michael. Um, I think that this idea is interesting that there are some sort of border be borders becoming less transmissible for some tendencies, also perhaps some tendencies from East to West as someone studying Russia and Eastern Europe. I remember well how disinformation at some point was a topic that was a topic of Eastern Europe. And then later it also became so prominent in the US domestic debate with President Trump. How is this a challenge that we can address disinformation as a challenge to um, democracies becoming hybrid versions of themselves? That's a good question. I think before we come up with much needed policy solutions, we have to try to rethink what has actually happened to Western societies. And it is obvious that people feel that with what we call simplistically globalization and the integration of, of global markets and the uh, mobility that, that, uh, that, that people can engage in, in in the modern age has to a certain degree privatized important functions of the sovereign. State functions are being privatized and they're often also transferred to non-elective bodies. The WTO is one example, uh, NATO might be another example. And people feel that state functions are being transferred to institutions that they uh, might not have full control over as, uh, as uh, uh, citizens and voters. And there's a parallel development, I think, which is explaining a lot of the disinterest and the anger against policymakers and politics uh, in general, is that people at the same time understand that there's a transfer of risk from the community to the individual. And I think this is, um, these are hallmarks of the post-Cold War era. And what I would suggest is a thought experiment. When the Cold War ended, 
the Westerners were slapping themselves on the shoulder, congratulating themselves that they won the war against communism. Um, but what we did not realize in the West is that the Berlin Wall came down into the Western direction. So Westerners could not lean against the Berlin Wall anymore and take it as a stabilizer to claim political, cultural, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, parliamentarian superiority. And my hypothesis is that we have underestimated the fact that the end of the Cold War and the crumbling of the Berlin Wall might have affected Western societies more than Eastern societies. Because for Eastern societies, the path was fairly clear. It was towards, at least in the first year, towards a modernization Western style, which then in some of the countries deviated, especially in Poland, Hungary. Interestingly, the countries that had culturally and economically the best starting, some of the best starting positions of the East European countries. But we have always suggested that the so-called victory of the West meant that A, Western societies did not change and that they did not have to change. And I think this is a massive misperception that we are paying a high price for because now we are all surprised how much they have changed and the degree to which democratic convictions have eroded. That would be my first thought experiment. If that thought has any merit, I would say then the second argument would be that we have to think back at the call to the Cold War period, which is a period of 30 to 40 years of geopolitical stability, because the Cold War got only hot in the periphery, in Bolivia and Congo and Vietnam and other places in Nicaragua, but never in the center. So it was an era of mass, incredible stability and almost continuous economic growth over 40 years. Never happened before in, in world history. So my, may we have to ask ourselves the uncomfortable question, if liberal democracy as we know and like it has been tied to this specific period of economic growth and geopolitical stability that has irreversibly ended in 1989. And, who's, and the end of that period was codified in, uh, during 9-11 and 2001 with the attacks uh, on New York and Washington DC. If that is true, I think we have a different conversation that really goes back not to how can we fix things, but what is actually the massive task ahead of us to reconstitute Western democracies in an entirely new environment. And let me just, and I apologize for going on a little too long, uh, just a, a footnote this with one um, thought on uh, Ivan's um, uh, comments on China. I completely agree with you because China to a, to, a, to a degree is a systemic competitor, but it, the question is how you frame it. Um, in, a, in a real politic uh, perspective from Washington, what Europeans should not underestimate is, this is not just trade questions for us here in, in the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. There are two massive developments that Europeans need to recognize. Number one is our Asian allies are standing in line asking for security and political guarantees so they can live their lives. Australia and New Zealand, New, New Zealand first and foremost, but also the traditional candidates like Taiwan, South Korea and Japan, and even the Philippines and even Vietnam. So there's massive pressure on the political system in the United States to have a position on China's militaristic and aggressive uh, regional policies. And then the other point is that we are seeing what I would describe as the second westernization of the United States because of immigration and demographic changes. The mathematical center of population in the United States moves from east to west five meters every day, which means that you have more people, more economic power, California being the fifth largest economy in the world by on its own, the integration of the United States and Mexico, the relevance of the Western hemisphere. These are all forces that create ma magnetic fields that drag the United States into the Pacific arena. And this will be for domestic and for foreign and security policy reasons, very difficult to resist. I again agree with Ivan that the question is how you frame things, but the notion that Europeans will be able to manage a new era of a transatlantic alliance is only viable if Europeans understand that for the first time in the history of the transatlantic alliance and transatlantic relationships, those relationships have to verify and validate themselves outside the Atlantic. 
And I think that's an interesting uh, dimension that we need to more for, fully uh, understand and debate. And if you just said we need to, we, con we constitute liberal democracy, does it, would you say looking forward how we can do this, that it always has to be against something? Because then the easy solution would be, well, then against China, because that's obviously the one that comes closest not to the not the same as the Soviet Union and also if we think about this um, as we considering liberal democracy um, to what extent does the climate dimension would have to be rethought in this as especially if we look at look at the younger generation even just said that they are the ones who who are left with the problems how do we have to think this dimension in Yeah, I mean, look, I think that obviously the competition with China is might be helpful in a, in a pretty banal political way. If you tell people, well, uh, take your pick, do you want to live like a Uyghur in, in China or, or like uh, somebody in, in a suburb in Hamburg, uh, make up your mind, that might be helpful to at least initiate a conversation, but it's obviously not sufficient. Um, Ivan has said that um, in Western societies, there's a tendency because they think of themselves as being perfect societies to blame outsiders from Russia to China and Muslims and immigrants and who else for their ills. And um, that requires to rethink how you want to um, construct Western societies in the 21st century in the context of a massive transformation of the labor sphere and of the way economic wealth is being produced. And in the case of Europe, most of all, in the uh, wake of massive demographic decline. I mean, if you want to put it bluntly, Europeans by the end of the century will have two options. They will either uh, accept a substantial skilled and non-skilled immigration from Africa or they will die out. It's that simple. But obviously in terms of policy to have this discussion, it is very difficult if not impossible because the moment you try to suggest progressive solutions to these issues, you might get kicked out of government. I mean, Kamala Harris's completely botched visit to Mexico and Guatemala is exhibit A in this context. She went to Guatemala and verbatim said to immigrants, do not come to the United States, it's dangerous, do not come here. And then she kind of refused to visit the border where we have created a situation that in terms of human rights, health, and the uh, sanctity of, uh, of, of the health uh, and the well-being of children is a complete disgrace to the traditions of the United States. So I do not say that this is an easy discussion, but we are, have a 30 year time delay since the end of the Cold War where we thought nothing had changed and nothing needed to change. And we have to make up for that lost time. And that means that we talk about transnational integration, about how to organize a global uh, sphere and a global economy. I think that global taxation uh, suggestion is actually an interesting uh, debate that all of a sudden many countries come together and say, Together, we can actually establish structures and we establish them as legitimately elected governments where the people can have a say in whether they think this is a good idea or not. And the key issue is uh, immigration and recognizing that we will see an era of um, human mobility that will be intense and necessary and ultimately beneficial. Um, but again, I have no illusions and I'm happy that I'm not uh, in a, in a policy making position and have to have these debates in, in the public because I know they're ugly, they're difficult and maybe they're unsuccessful, but that these will be the parameters along which we can reconstitute a 21st century notion of a liberal democracy. If we fail to do that, um, we might be in a very, very different uh, situation 20, 30 or 40 years from now. Even if you agree with this, that we need some sort of greater restructuring and that we have basically slept the last 30 years, what kind of institutions do we need to tackle and address these challenges? Are our institutions that are, again, still very much bound to the nation state, the right governance structures to address this, these big challenges? Uh, I think we still can't hear you even. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. I first want to agree with one of the central arguments that Michael did, namely that when the end of the Cold War came, the expectations in the West was that the East is going to change and the West is going to remain the same. And by the way, this is very important because if you see these 30 years, this was the period of migration of the East to the West. 
Some migrated individually, mostly with their countries, but the idea was that we're keeping the Western institutions and we expect others to integrate in that. And we saw how difficult it is when we talk about societies which are culturally much more closer and historically have much more shared experience uh, with West Europeans than what is going to happen globally in the next 20 or 30 years. So from this point of view, the story is that paradoxically, you cannot integrate any type of a big migration flow without changing yourself. But this is easy to be said than to be done. And I'm going to tell you why. We talk now about democracy. The experience that we have with democracy is that the experience of democracy in the nation states. And the nation states was very much kind of uh, conditioned on the fact that you have a permanent majorities and permanent minorities. This is where basically the Westphalian tradition, I'm talking Europe comes from. And then you have the democratization of the nation states and you're living with the idea of two majorities. This is like the two bodies of the king. Uh, one majority is changing any four years, but there is still the idea that you have this majority, which is cultural, which is demographic, which basically keep the nation state. What we are seeing now is for the first time, electoral majorities coming out of the elections and the United States is the greatest example of this, is challenging the idea of the prevalence of the demographic and ethnic and cultural majorities that were uh, the base of these nation states. And listen, this is dramatic. When Trump said that the elections were rigged, his major argument was that wrong people were allowed to vote. When basically he said, this is the last elections that we can win, the idea was that all these migrants, if they're going to get their voting rights are going dramatically to change the body politics of the United States. But this is going to start happening also in Europe. Nevertheless, that still, this is a very different project. So then you should decide in what exactly you are integrating. And believe me, it's not simply about institutions. This is about a two very different ideas of what is about the national identities? Can you have a democracy without national identities? There is a one uh, famous restaurant in Vienna, which used to be an Italian restaurant with an Italian owner, Italian uh, cook, Italian basically waiters some 50 years ago. And now the owner is Egyptian. All of the waiters have never been in Italy. They don't speak Italian, but the menu is an Italian. The music is the Italian. Nobody speaks Italian of the people in the restaurant. Nobody has been uh, in Italy uh, from the staff. The question is, is this an Italian restaurant or is this a restaurant with an Italian food? Uh, and there you're going to see two very different kinds of uh, answers to these questions. People are going to say it's about the menu. And somebody said, no, a restaurant in which Italians do not feel at home is not an Italian restaurant. I'm saying this because these kind of questions cannot be solved simply easily institutionally. It's not simply about improving the governments. By the way, this is not going to be done through transparency and this type of a mantras that people talk about. This is basically a new social contract. And of course, in this new social contract, particularly in the United States, this is why the generational divide is so strong. The younger generation is much more diverse than the previous generation. So for them, this is not so scary. Uh, they don't basically see this as the end of the world, the end of the nation state as you know it. But imagine how it looks like for some of these European societies where till yesterday, the ethnic homogeneity was 95%. Listen, I have seen for the first time a Chinese person in my life when I was 30 years old. My son in Vienna has two Chinese friends, but this is, it's a very short period of time. And I do believe one of the major problems that we are facing is that they should be also a lot about how we are debating things. It's about the quality of our cultural debate to try to imagine the world of tomorrow. And uh, this is why for me, this nostalgia story is so important because in 2019, Bertelsmann Foundation has a pan-European survey that shows that the majority of Europeans believe that life was better before. They're not going to agree when before, but it was before. And this is this nostalgic kind of a very strong nostalgic view for different reasons in different social groups uh, that makes very difficult this conversation about the future. We reach the moment in which, because Europe is losing demographically, we are losing power, we start to fear the future. It's very difficult to transform yourself if you fear the future. 
This is the biggest issue. And I do believe you see this with the Republican Party in the United States. You see it in many ways in Europe. So how not to fear the future is the first question. When we learn to this, when basically we agree on this, institutions, you can start to change the meaning of citizenship, many things that are happening. But before you have this conversation, institutional change is not going to be enough. Thank you, Ivan, for reminding us that um, progressives should not, not only think in terms of political institutions as we very much like to do because that's something we can easily influence and shape and reform and do something but that we also have to think about national identity and I like the example of the restaurant I think just around the corner I have two or three similar Italian restaurants here in Berlin. Um, let me also say that um, our participants are very much welcome to contribute questions via the chat. Um, I already have a couple of questions and we'll um, read them out soon. But first, let me give a short statement, or read out a short statement um, to you from Agnieszka Jemanovic Bonk, who unfortunately is not able to join us via internet today. But she says that she's always, she's not able to fully participate. Um, but since the question of the state of democracy after the pandemic is a key question also for Polish society, she wants to say that Poland has gone through a crisis of democracy for years now and that the pandemic has even worsened the crisis since it is used as an excuse to further oppress civic and human rights. At the same time, she argues it made it more acceptable for part of the society and people put in the face of an objective threat. And I think this will relates to some of the arguments that you've made at the beginning, Ivan, that the pandemic can make us more, yeah, more, more accepting some um, autocratic, autocratic measures. She says that this makes it all the more important and urgent to ask questions about the possibility of strengthening, them, strengthening democratic mechanisms. And she hopes she will have the opportunity to discuss the issue with us in the near future. We hope so too, since her voice and the Polish voice is very really important in this discussion. Let me give a first question to you, Michael, which has turned up in the chat and relates to your idea of virtual immigrants. Um, Mark Castle would like to know and ask you whether this is the same group that strongly opposed civil rights changes in the 1960s and integration in the 1950s. So Trump voters were energized by ways as they were in previous decades. So what is the difference now? That's a question for Mark. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for this question. And just one um, minor correction, and that might have been me. I, I call them virtual emigrants with an E, not with an I. So these are people that are emigrating out of the constitutional and democratic traditions, right? I mean, they still live in the United States and they live in their, their uh, suburbs in, in Cleveland and, and Oklahoma yeah. and Tennessee, but they have emigrated from that um, moral inventory that has uh, codified the political arena in the United States so much. And yes, um, these are um, similar groups of people that were against racial integration in the 50s and 60s, but of course, prejudice and authoritarian identifications themselves have a history. They are not artifacts that stay the same uh, over the course of generations. So I think the, the way people uh, deal with the uh, diversity in the United States right now is slightly different than in the 50s and 60s. Although I think it is important uh, what Mark points out because the 1960s were really the point uh, in American um, newer history where with racial integration, um, a major transformation set in namely that the entire political spectrum was realigned because there were so many uh, Democrats in the South in the 1950s and 60s, the so-called Dixiecrats, that vigorously supported racial segregation and were racists, um, that they started leaving the Democratic Party after the great civil rights achievements and Lyndon, President Lyndon B. Johnson's uh, signature under the Civil Rights and the Voting Act, Rights Act and the Great Society Program. And that uh, led over the following 20 years to the fact that a lot of people with authoritarian orientations um, went to move from the Democratic to the Republican Party. Today, to distinguish voters, authoritarian identifications is the most precise distinguishing factors, roughly 
three quarters of Republican voters have all the authoritarian orientations, roughly a quarter of Democratic voters have that. So you have a concentration of authoritarianism in that party that goes back to that time period that Mark um, points out. And obviously that's very different than a, in a parliamentarian system where in Germany you have probably authoritarian identifications yeah. among links party voters, the fringes of the CDU, some of the national liberals in the FDP, some dogmatic working class parts of SPD and obviously the AFD. So you have a greater distribution of authoritarianism, if you will. This is why uh, it was so interesting. And I think we have collectively overlooked this. When Sarah Palin was pre candidate for vice president with uh, John McCain, one of John McCain's not so smart decisions, by the way, to nominate her, um, she always talked about the real America. We were laughing this off and saying she's just this hoodlum from Alaska and she doesn't know what she's talking about. That actually resonated and established a narrative within conservative circles in the Republican Party because the real America that she spoke about was about the illusion to turn back the wheel of history um, to the year 1956 when for the first time in Little Rock, Arkansas, African uh, American school children were brought to a white majority school and had to be protected by the National Guard. And the um, point is that people started to look, as Ivan said, back into a history that never existed in the way they imagine it as a black and white photography. Because this is where you uh, can gather greater meaning and greater orientation in a society that becomes increasingly complex today by suggesting that 30, 40, 50 years ago, things were just a lot easier, more clearly cut and much better organized. That obviously itself is part of an ideological construct, but I think this is one of the reasons why Ivan uh, is able to quote these amazing opinion polls that people actually suggest that it was better to live in, uh, the, in Poland in the 1970s and in, in Hungary and Eastern Germany uh, than today. So I think uh, this is an interesting um, uh, construct, but in, again, in the 50s and 60s, white people felt and were in the majority and were aggressively segregating African Americans. Today, uh, it is more a dynamic of an emigration out of American traditions and becoming un-American uh, in a certain way, which is uh, not as open and as aggressive because people know that in the mid 2040s, we will not have a wide majority anymore and American society is so rapidly changing that people chose different ways of expressing their prejudice and authoritarian orientations than they did 50 years ago. Thank you, Michael. Let's perhaps turn it um, back to Europe for one moment. I want to come back to what you said at the beginning, Ivan, about the pandemic being not so much a disruptor, but rather an accelerator and perhaps having a more limited impact also when it comes to populism than we expected. And that is true to some extent, especially in Germany, for example, populist parties are not have not benefited from the pandemic. Are you concerned that this is just because we were in such a crisis situation and needed immediate action and that the post-pandemic phase, which will then again bring up questions of economic redistribution and so on, might lead to a return of populism. And I'm thinking now especially to elections in, in France next year, for instance. Um, could we see a delay of populism and a, of a success of populism in reaction to the pandemic? Well, for sure, uh, uh, for sure you see, but uh, when we're talking about populism, we took as if certain phenomena which is going to disappear. Listen, we are seeing a major transformation of our political regimes and this populist party is a part of it. And by the way, they are very strong uh, spokespersons for the nostalgia that we're talking about. Give me back France as it used to be. So in a certain way, normally people are dreaming about the future, but now you have societies for very understandable reason, by the way, trying to dream about the past. Because don't forget, Europe is going to lose power. Nevertheless, if what we're going to do, demography is an important thing. We are going to be six or 7% or even less of the population in 2050. They're going to be major redistribution. Uh, the idea that here we're going to be vaccinated at 100% and in the rest of the world, 5%, it's not going to be the way it's going to work in 20 or 30 years. And losing power is never a particularly happy process. The problem is, and this is the interesting story, to try to understand that, first of all, having so much power was unnatural. And secondly, that in a certain way, sharing power is the way 
to basically avoid much more cataclysmic and much more negative developments. I do believe this is why this is a difficult uh, conversation. Populist parties lost in this first one and a half year, because at least I could be wrong, but I do believe psychologically populism is much more rooted in anxiety than in fear. Anxiety is a fear of everything. You fear that the world is going wrong. You fear that nobody is taking uh, your opinion seriously. And then came the pandemic and it was a real fear. Fear for your life, fear for the life of the people that you love. Uh, and then fear is a disciplining kind of emotion. Why anxiety, when you're anxious, you try to find somebody who is going to articulate how you feel. In the moment of real fear, you're looking for somebody to help you to solve the problem. So as a result of it, governments benefited incredibly in the beginning. Nevertheless, by the way, who was in government? Because people look at the government and said, help us, contain it. You're right. And it very much also depends on how Europe is going to look at the end of September. Uh, because the, listen, if we're going to have a new lockdowns after September, this politically is going to be extremely dramatic, extremely dramatic. Secondly, a year ago, Europe was looking around. We were not doing well, but others are not doing better, let's put it mildly. The United States was just in a free fall. United Kingdom doing badly. So if on the 1st of October, suddenly Americans are growing economically and basically have normalized their life, if the United Kingdom is doing the same and Europe is locked uh, in a type of political and economic paralysis, this is going to have a high legitimacy cost. Because one of the things that happened as a result of the pandemic is that if there is a dictatorship in Europe today, this is the dictatorship of comparisons. Because there was one issue that is totally dominating the public debate, people are comparing all the time what is happening in their countries and what is happening in the neighboring countries. How many people infected, how many people vaccinated, what is happening on the economy. If Europe is going to be perceived as a loser at the end of this process, of course, this is going to create a major crisis also in the confidence of the European project as a whole. And it's not by accident that now the major kind of a skepticism to the EU as a result of the last three months come from countries like Germany and France and not from the small countries on the periphery who didn't believe that they were going to do better on their own either to getting vaccines or getting vaccinated. But Germans and French said, why the EU? Probably we could have done better on our own. Thank you, Ivan. I think that's a fascinating explanation that fear is different than, than anxiety um, for the lack of populist rise in the pandemic. But let me think this one step further. If we, for instance, here in, in Berlin, there were a lot of demonstrations or calls from the younger generation, you can act in the pandemic crisis, but what about the climate crisis, right? So if we think this further to the next big challenge and to the next big cha um, crisis, the, the climate crisis, is this also a situation where we will see people being afraid and reacting with fear to the possible changes that will occur? Is this a too slow process for a similar reaction? And do we need similar to some extent draconian measures, as some climate activists would argue, to tackle this crisis, the climate crisis, in a similar strong way as we tackled the pandemic? First, nevertheless, it's what we're going to do on our own. I've been Europeans particularly, but even Europeans and Americans, we're not going to be able to tackle the climate crisis. And this is the major story. So in a certain way, you can decide to vaccinate all of your population, but if the rest of the world is not vaccinated, you can all go back to normalcy. Uh, and unfortunately, this crisis shows a very low level of international cooperation. Uh, and this is shocking in a certain way because this was a crisis which should give, give incentives to the government to work together. It is not a war, it's not even a migration. Uh, but of course, the climate was very important for this younger generation, exactly because particularly in Europe, this is a generation which is in a political minority. For them to influence politics is really to try to influence the agenda, to try to say, you should listen to us because we speak not only on behalf of ourselves, but those who are not born yet. So strangely enough, the young people basically enlarged their political constituencies 
getting all those who are not born yet. Uh, it's funny enough in American, of course, Republican uh, democratic debate, Republicans used to speak on behalf of the unborn because of the abortion. <laughs> now it is uh, very much. But the problem with the climate is that the expectations of the people, this is about the timing. And I'm always making one distinction. For example, the Green Party uh, in Germany and all of you know, <laughs> much more than it came also very much connected to the fear of the nuclear war. But if you compare these two, you're going to see two important differences when it comes to the policy perception. First, if there's going to be a nuclear war, we all are going to die at the same time. Listen, even if the climate change uh, is not going to be contained, if basically global warming continues, some places are going basically to get it hard much earlier than others. So are you trying to save the world or are you trying to save your part of the world? And I do believe that people like Trump, when they said, okay, climate change is not a problem, they said, we're not ready to save everybody. We should try to think how to save on our, ourselves only. And secondly, during the anti-nuclear movement, the basic problem is how not to allow the governments to do something wrong. Here, you should push them to do something right. And this is much more difficult. It is much easier to prevent the governments of doing something that you don't want than trying to push them to do something that you want. But even within the climate activists, you're not going to have an agreement exactly what and exactly when. And from this point of view, it's going to be the mobilization impact of climate is incredible. If they're not going to be a responsiveness on the climate issues, the young generation will go on the they jump on the, on the trees. There was this famous novel by Tal Calvino about a young guy who was so much unhappy with their family that he spent the rest of his life just on the trees, never going to the earth. This is going to be basic. This is going to be a generation that is going to be lost. They're going to refuse to be part of it anymore. But how to have an effective policy, how to get China with whom we're going to compete to cooperate on certain issues, not easy to be said than to be done. Because geopolitics is not going to disappear. So when the Chinese president or Russian president, they're talking about the global warming and so on, they see the risk. Listen, this is basically well-briefed people. But on the other side, you try to see what you can gain geopolitically out of this crisis too. And this is true for everybody. Thank you, Ivan. Michael, that's exactly what, what Joe Biden and John Kerry are trying at the moment to build a coalition, a global coalition for the fight against climate change so that the reaction is not as, uh, as unstructured as was the reaction was to the pandemic. How do you assess these efforts? And let me also give you a question of Katharina Hoffmann. She was um, a co-designer of this debate from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And she also wants to ask you again, what whether the concept of resilient democracies that Biden introduced and stated in England is really something that we should refer to and relate to in the future. Yeah, um, uh, thank you. And thank you, Katarina, for this uh, uh, interesting but also very difficult question. I, I think that climate change is um, high on the agenda here, not only because of uh, the global impact that the United States sees, but also for two additional reasons, because it is a potential bridge builder to our uh, European and Asian allies that uh, after the devastations of the Trump era and some lingering uh, issues in the defense and in the trade sphere uh, really offers cooperation. And secondly, um, Joe Biden is acutely aware of the fact that um, youth movements um, uh, like uh, Sunrise and other ecological and environmental movements in the United States have contributed grassroots voter turnout to his election to a degree that he cannot lose that important part of the coalition, neither for the midterm elections in 2022, nor in for presidential elections in 2024. So there are massive domestic drivers uh, really like banal, simple drivers of politics that you that you have to be on front of on the front of this issue because otherwise you lose an entire generation. It's interesting that um, um, for the Generation Z, which is a majority non-white in the United States, um, across ethnic groups and and linguistic groups, climate change is one of the unifying factors, as Ivan has pointed out. 
Um, so I think that's an, it's an important part. It also it's absolutely clear that there's a geopolitical dimension of climate change because we need to make sure that uh, that uh, people are fed. We uh, are acutely aware of on the of the impact of climate change on agricultural production. Uh, I don't know whether people are following um, the dramatic um, rise in in food prices that we have seen over the last few months, which in part, in no small part is driven by a Chinese government decision to produce less and import more because China can afford to uh, buy up massive amounts of uh, staples in the international markets. And obviously we still remember that um, food scarcity uh, and high wheat and bread prices were one of the main drivers in the Arab Spring. So um, it, I think people are acutely aware of the fact that this is important. This is one of the reasons why Joe Biden nominated uh, John Kerry uh, to a cabinet level position. It's not only that he's an old buddy of his, but the fact that we have a climate uh, envoy who is part of every meeting of the National Security Council and the senior advisors when it really comes to the hard security issues in the United States, which is the major uh, and most important decision making body in every White House. That's really a signal that this is a massive issue for this administration. And I think with regard to Katarina's question where she asked about the concept of resilient democracies and Joe Biden in, 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 in London and England uh, talking about the need to defend democracy, democratization internally and worldwide. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a belief that he really holds. And obviously after January 6th and the, and the attack of uh, the first time that Americans attacked their own capital, um, this becomes increasingly clear that we have a lot of homework to do when it comes to uh, democratization and, and denazification and also re-education of, of the United States uh, and of our institutions. There's an open letter by 124 former generals and admirals where they say Joe Biden is mentally unfit to be the president. The election was rigged. The American people are not represented anymore. That's like one seventh of the active duty leadership of the entire US military. Not even to talk about General Flynn and, 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 and Admiral McMaster who have served in the Trump administration. It shows that massive institutions here in the United States really need to reconfigure the way they train um, their representatives when it comes to internal democracy. And I also believe that with um, uh, supporting or uh, having a human rights and democracy driven foreign policy. This is an honest conviction, not only of uh, the president, but also of his national security advisor, uh, Jake Sullivan and of Tony Blinken, the secretary of state. But this obviously as a global power is much easier said than done because you have very hard questions to answer if you have the military capabilities. The question is, do you intervene in Syria to support people and to protect the civilian population if the regime is dropping bombs on schools and hospitals? Are you going to commit 70,000 soldiers, which was the Pentagon's estimate for a, for a Syria invasion? Or Barack Obama decided not to do that. Um, it was a similar question whether um, you would send troops into Libya. That was a discussion also in, uh, in Italy and in Germany and France, uh, and the decision was not to do that. Um, the Europeans, I would suggest, had, would have had an opportunity after Donald Trump supported, uh, stopped our support or diminished our support for the uh, uh, northern Iraqi Kurds, which is kind of the only semi-democratic parliamentarian, however you want to know it, uh, um, political entity in the entire region outside Israel. And Europeans, again, were not willing to establish a ground force there, which would have made it impossible for the Turkish uh, regime to, um, to start their um, illegitimate and illegal uh, invasion of Northern Iraq. So, I mean, these are really hard questions. Uh, if you want to make a democracy a guiding principle for your foreign policy, in the case of Germany, the chancellor would have to figure out whether she's willing to risk 850,000 jobs in the German car industry and finally take on China, on Hong Kong, suppressing students, independence movements, democracy, and, and the incarceration of a million Uyghurs. So yeah. this is com complicated, but I think we need to push this conversation forward. And the first step would be for Western societies, especially for the United States as a global power, to admit publicly that there is a double standard and that sometimes you need double standards as a global power. If you need your naval bases in Bahrain, you might not like the regime a lot, but geostrategically that's important. But then you can figure out how you compensate for that in other policy arenas. And there are opportunities and it's our task to push these discussions. Thank you so much, Michael. 
we have now reached the the basically the end of our discussion, but I think that was a very important question that you just brought up the question, do we to some extent have to accept double standards if we have a strategic goal that we want to pursue? For Before we end the discussion, let me give to both of you a very quick question. Please answer within two or three sentences. Um, it's the general question of the Progressive Governance Summit. So how can we implement progressive values and strengthen our democratic institutions? But what is interesting is that someone from the audience has added uh, a detail to this question. Should we prioritize countering the far right in a cultural war or in a cultural area? Or should we bring social reforms forward? If you had to choose between the two or a third option, what would be your response? Ivan, you go first. My answer is going to be very short. Listen, it's going to depend where. <laughs> the, the idea that there is one answer which is not contextual and so on. Uh, there are certain places in which the cultural work has become the way the politics functions. To try to ignore it is going to be wrong. At the same time, I do believe democratic society functions much better when they're trying to solve social questions than basically fights uh, over cultural issues. But I don't believe it's a universal answer. Mm -hmm. In some places, one or the other. Michael, do you share this view? Yes, and I think with regard to the United States, I would say we have to rebuild a social con contract. This is something uh, President Biden and his administration is vigorously um, investing in and, and also putting up the money. Um, that we need to do this. And at the same time, we need to uh, reconfigure our relationship uh, with the region and especially recognize that we have a integration of North America between Canada, the United States and Mexico that is uh, much more advanced than the Montana Union in Europe in the 1950s and early 60s. And this has not really uh, penetrated the policy narratives and the public sphere as a, as a new form of uh, social, cultural, uh, economic and environmental interconnectivity on the North American continent. I think that discussion needs to be led and that would also open up uh, a new perspective on what a future North America and a future United States is going to look like. Thank you for these great takeaways and thank you also for the discussion. Very sorry that we could not have um, Agnieszka with us all the time, but I hope she had the chance to follow at least part of the discussions. Thank you to you. Thank you to our participants who added their questions. I think it was really an insightful and fascinating discussion. I uh, at least have a couple and a lot of points that I will take with me and think about. For our participants, if you like, please fill out the feedback form that was just posted by the team in the chat. And if you want to continue the discussion, there's also a community space where you can continue to debate the ideas of this session. With this, thank you so much, Ivan. Thank you, Michael. It was a great discussion. I wish you a good afternoon, evening, morning, and all the best. Thank you so much, Lena.